So in the last video, we talked about the ring oscillator. And we analyzed it as three common source amplifiers, just in tandem, connected in tandem with each other. And we said that each had a certain load capacitance, CL, a certain drain resistance, RD, associated with it. And they're all connected together like so. And at the very end, we applied unity feedback, sending the output of the final oscillator to the input of the last one. And we found that if you have a gain equal to two, then the frequent, this, this will oscillate, and the frequency it will do so is at root three over RD times CL. And again, this was all assuming that CL was our dominant um, or was responsible for our dominant pull. And this assumption is often justified. Sometimes it's not, but we'll, we'll pretend it is here. Um, this guy is also CL, this guy is also CL. Okay, but something was wrong with the picture, and that's that we can't get a gain of exactly two. So how do we get this circuit to oscillate? Um, well, if we analyze, let's analyze just qualitatively. Uh, let's look at the root locus of this, or just the poles of this system. So if you solve the cubic equation, uh, you'll find that the poles are located at minus uh, 1 plus a times omega o, o which I'm going to say is the frequency of oscillation, this guy, uh, and minus... Um, a minus 2 over 2 plus j a squared of 3 over 2, or plus or minus. So these are the two different poles of our system. So one's over here on the real axis, and we will just ignore that pole for the rest of, uh, the rest of this analysis. And the other two are at a real location of a minus 2 over 2. So if A equals 2, then this real part is 0, and this real part, this imaginary part, is plus or minus root 3, or root 3 times omega naught. This is all multiplied by omega naught. This is the imaginary axis, and this is the real axis for our closed loop poles. Um, okay, so what happens if our gain is slightly less than two? Uh, what, what happens to our system then? Well, these poles are going to move a little bit like this. So the frequency is going to decrease slightly, and they're going to move onto the left half of the uh, S-plane, which means that the response in the time domain to an impulse will look like this. It'll oscillate but it'll decay. And so this isn't a very interesting system because this is just the second order um, linear system that we've analyzed to death in various courses. So it's not going to oscillate. Nothing interesting is going to happen. But if you have a gain slightly larger than 2, so A is greater than 2, then the poles will move in this direction. So the frequency will increase a little bit. And the real part will cross into the right half plane, or the, the pole will cross into the right half plane. So your response will look like this. It'll start growing with time. And initially, that seems like a problem because, well, we can't, our, these circuits are real circuits. They can't sustain a growing oscillation forever. Uh, and you're right. But the the thing that will come to save us here is actually nonlinearity. So we know that as the amplitude increases, so as the input amplitude to one of these transistors increases, the gain actually decreases. This is the gain compression that we talked about previously. So as the amplitude starts to increase in the time domain, this pole, which is initially to, let's say it's over here to the right, 
Okay, actually, that's that's not realistic. Let's just erase these. Let's say our pole starts to the right for a is greater than 2. But then as we increase in time, these poles will start to move in this direction. And that might seem kind of bizarre. The poles are not moving with frequency or feedback, but they're moving uh, as a function of time. And this is because the system is time variant. Uh, so we've been we've broken one of the assumptions for LTI analysis. Poles aren't supposed to move with time, um, but it's as if they are. And at some point, the gain is going to get compressed to a is equal to 2 or a is less than 2. And if a is less than 2, then our signal will start to shrink. So it was growing, but now a becomes less than 2, so it starts to shrink. But then as it shrinks, uh, the poles move again. So they move back into the right half plane because the amplitude is smaller, and so the gain gets closer to the DC gain, so the gain starts to increase. Let's say that this section, let's do this in green. So the amplitude, again, starts to grow. And this process will repeat itself indefinitely, and I've kind of uh, exaggerated it here, but that's the basic idea. As it doesn't matter that our gain is greater than 2, because gain compression our nonlinearity will ensure that at some point it becomes less than or equal to two and we will get sustained oscillation. But in reality, the oscillation will look like, look like this with time. It'll kind of have a varying envelope. And this is great because this allows us to design any amplifier with gain greater than two or inverting gain uh, with magnitude greater than two and the amplifier will oscillate, and it's nonlinearity that actually saves us. So nonlinearity, as much as we hate it, uh, can actually be helpful.